previously on the Lobby USA, Noah Pollock from the Emergency Committee for Israel tells supporters how to describe the BDS movement. When you talk about BDS, you talk about them as a movement that absolutely endorses violence against civilians, AKA terrorism. Why they're doing this? They always try to connect us, to connect dots that they don't exist. In the final episode of the Lobby USA, a look ahead. After half a century of Israeli occupation, hopes that a peace deal could create two states in the lands of historic Palestine are fading fast. So how will the lobby respond? Our man on the inside finds out. Using an undercover reporter, Al Jazeera's investigative unit infiltrates one of the most powerful lobbies in the world. We examine how the lobby, led by APAC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, has secured unwavering support in Congress. Congressmen don't do anything unless you pressure them. And the only way to do that is with money. What the lobby is all about is to make sure that Israel gets special treatment from the United States forever. But after occupying Palestinian lands for half a century, the pro-Israel lobby is facing a new challenge. We called for a full boycott of Israel, divesting from it, and eventually imposing sanctions on it to achieve UN stipulated rights of the Palestinian people. A movement to boycott, divest, and impose sanctions on Israel, BDS, was formed on American campuses. It seems to be achieving its goals. It threatens future American support for Israel. We believe in justice for all people. That means the occupation has to end. Israel's Ministry of Strategic Affairs responded with a covert operation to defeat BDS. The Israeli government leverages Jewish organizations yes. in the diaspora. Absolutely. It's a psychological campaign involving spying and smears. You discredit the messenger as a way of discrediting the message. Just stay on message. And what is that message? BDS is a hate movement. While our reporter monitored pro-Israel groups, he was asked to go undercover for the lobby. You're going into enemy territory, not for everybody. Our undercover reporter was attending a dinner at the annual conference of the Israeli-American Council in Washington. He met an American involved in the Israeli government's anti-BDS campaign. So in my job, I get to work with every major yeah. news network. Yeah. I don't even do media. I do academic work. Every university president takes our calls, takes our meetings. There's a genuine government organization. The discussion was dominated by the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. The three-day conference brings together the constellation of pro-Israel lobby groups in the U.S. On the surface, things seem to be looking good for Israel. Israel's booming. It's the startup nation. More venture capital is going into Israel today than at any other time in history. So why don't we just calm down, realize that BDS is worthless, it's losing, and ignore it. I don't think BDS was ever supposed to be about getting colleges to take their money out of Israel. So if we focus on the dollars, we could feel really good about ourselves. If we focus on the fact that an effort's being made to distance us, those who love Israel, Israel, from the rising generation, I think we need to worry. 
when you get to the millennials and the students, it's a bad situation. And, and it's getting to the point now where the majority is more favorable towards the Palestinians than the Israelis. While numerous speakers discuss ways to combat BDS, the lack of civil rights for Palestinians living under Israeli control was not raised. Nobody talks about the reason why BDS exists at all. What's the model for the BDS movement? The model is South Africa. So was that a bad thing to do? An apartheid regime which denied equal rights to black South Africans was weakened and ultimately collapsed after a global economic and political boycott. They're worried that the BDS movement will get to the stature that the South Africa boycott got to. So they're trying to stop it now. Imagine if the apartheid regime of the Klerk were able to have a lobby in America that it was a crime to support the, that, that boycott. Imagine that. For nearly two decades, Israel's occupation was portrayed as temporary, while both sides pursued what's called a two-state solution. The two-state solution. This is where the Palestinians get a state of their own in the occupied territories, i.e. the West Bank and Gaza. But there's a problem. Jewish-only settlements have continued to grow within the boundary of a proposed Palestinian state. Successive US governments have openly doubted whether a viable Palestinian nation is either possible or necessary. The settler agenda is defining the future of Israel. And their stated purpose is clear. They believe in one state, greater Israel. In fact, one prominent minister declared just after the US election, and I quote, the era of the two-state solution is over. I'm looking at two state and one state and I like the one that both parties like. I'm very happy with the one that both parties like. I can live with either one. If the choice is one state, Israel can either be Jewish or democratic. It cannot be both. More and more people are beginning to buy into the argument that Israel is turning itself into an apartheid state. It used to be the case that the word apartheid was never used with Israel. In order to discredit the apartheid label, the lobby has launched a campaign to try to co-opt black South Africans. Black South Africans who were apartheid activists, who were brought to Israel, saw the reality, came home angry at BDS. They felt lied to, they felt that there, someone had tried to steal their narrative. This is an effective tool. Bringing these black South African former BDS activists, now Israel supporters, to American campuses. During his volunteership, Tony learned that the Israel Project has been developing a strategy called Stop Stealing My Apartheid. The plan is to feed articles written by black South Africans into the American media, claiming that BDS has distorted their history. If you're disgusted by segregation in this country, if you're disgusted by South African apartheid, then you should also be disgusted by Israeli apartheid. Another workshop was addressed by Israeli diplomats from consulates in the US. Black Lives Matter had attracted particular criticism after voicing support for the BDS movement. It appears that Israel's diplomats may be trying to challenge the apartheid label by canvassing support amongst African Americans. The major problem of Israel is with the young generation of the black community. Black Lives Matter starts there. I had last week a dinner, sit-down dinner at my house with some of the people which are considered the leadership of the black community and the very important people. They can be part of our uh, doing an activity. Pro-Israel groups are trying to cultivate a new generation of black leaders that is pro-Israel by bringing them to APEC conferences on all expenses paid trips, 
by taking them on delegations to Israel. They're doing that because they're afraid of BDS and they're afraid of Black Lives Matter, which is this new struggle for black freedom that also sees black freedom as situated in a, in a larger context. In 2014, Israel launched the siege of Gaza. In the same summer, police in Ferguson killed Mike Brown, and Ferguson rose up. And on the news at night, there would be both the latest out of Gaza and the latest out of Ferguson. There was solidarity that was expressed online with the Ferguson uprising. There were Palestinians who took to Twitter to cheer on the rebels of Ferguson and explain how to deal with tear gas. Israel's diplomats have responded by evoking the legacy of Martin Luther King, claiming that the campaign for Palestinian civil rights bears no resemblance to the civil rights movement in America. Dr. Clarence B. Jones, who wrote the draft speech for Martin Luther King, I had a dream. He was his lawyer, he was his close friend. He's somebody that I reached out to. He became a very close and personal friend. Because of that relationship, he published three articles in the Huffington Post explaining why their agenda was hijacked. Martin Luther King will turn in his grave if he saw the anti-Israel tendencies or the policies that are starting to emerge in Black Lives Matter. There's something on one hand laughable about it, but there's something also really insidious about this. You're using the credibility of a freedom struggle to try to oppose another freedom struggle. And I think that that's appalling. Soon after Black Lives Matter declared support for BDS, a fundraiser at a New York nightclub was suddenly canceled. The venue's management said it didn't approve of the movement's stance on Israel. Tony was told by his boss, Eric, that the Israel project was behind the decision. I don't know if you saw that uh, this club, you know, ditched a Black Lives Matter event. One of our daughters, we just put in a call to him, and then we put in a call to the police. Well, to shut down this Black Lives Matter event. I think it's really appalling that a system in Israel has devised incredible and comprehensive ways to have a violent regime against Palestinians, that they would also invest resources into making sure to shore up support for that oppression here. One evening at the IAC conference, Tony met a prominent activist. He's associated with the hardline trend in the pro-Israel lobby. Noah Pollock argues that tough tactics are needed to counter the apartheid label. Given, like, we're going to be more pro Israel than you can even imagine. Just to, like, provoke everyone. Pollock believes the American public, unlike those in Britain, will accept his gloves off strategy. The majority of Americans are pro Israel. Whereas, if you take a poll of Israel in the UK, it's just pure hatred. Your country, like, basically let half of Pakistan do it. You know? So you have a different problem than we do here. Tony was told of a demonstration that Noah Pollock was organizing. A bus took protesters to an event organized by the pro-BDS movement, Students for Justice in Palestine. Hey, man. I'm Tony. Marshall. Nice, nice to meet you. Yeah. This is one of those things where either it's going to be amazing and we're going to defeat BDS, or we're just broken. We can't beat him, join him. I'm obsessed with winning, you know, so I just want to win. So yeah, I want to win something. I don't win anymore. <laughs> The protesters are on a fellowship program run by a conservative think tank called the Hoover Institution. The whole fellowship is scrappy. It's like, you guys are being like foot soldiers and conservative. This is actually the first foot soldier activity that I think we've been forced to do. 
Tony, what's your connection to the conspiracy that we're all part of? Yeah, the Israel Project. So you can't uh, not come. Their plan is to disrupt the National Conference of Students for Justice in Palestine. Marshall said that the pro-Israel protest had been poorly planned. It's a very fly-by-the-pants procedure. It was basically just like Noah Paula coming and being like, look, there are these jihadis who basically support <laughs> suicide bombing, and they're at a campus, and you have to stop them. So, a chance to shout at Arabs? As we're leaving, we mentioned to our boss yesterday that we're going. She's like, oh, yeah, that's mandatory. You need to go. While they've been told they have to take part in the protest, not everyone on the bus is convinced it's good for their reputation. Do you know what my worst nightmare is? I'm actually not kidding. It's a photo of Dion and I together. And we're just like clearly identifiable. And they're like, oh, who are these like traitors who sold out to the Jewish conspiracy for money? And I'm like, we did. We cost $50,000 plus benefits. As the bus leaves, they discuss whether there's any point in staging the protest. I'm just skeptical. Of using the protesting tactic against them? Well, that's not, a, that's not our demographic. They don't. Like, the reason protests work is when, like, the people involved really care about it and, like, want to be there. But then no, what are we supposed to do? Because they, they keep existing and they keep expanding. And no matter how many lawmakers come out against BDS, they keep growing. Well, no, you're right. Like, you should do something. But at the end of the day, like, the notion that the right is ever going to dominate any sort of campus protest is ridiculous. You can't just let them. Well, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying and that's that what happened. If I were a high-level Jewish donor, I would be like a little more realistic about the expectations. So what would you do if you were a high-level Jewish donor? I can continue to do what, what, what you're doing, which is focusing on the actual power structures that you power structures in themselves. Like the reality is there's not a single college president in this country that would actually sign BDS. There is not a but single- they all allow SGP to exist in their campus. Because of free speech, they cannot right. let them. So what are they supposed to do about it? When a protest is sponsored and organized by outsiders, but made to appear like a popular grassroots movement, it's known as astroturfing. So they did a really job of getting me excited to show up and protest. It's kind of, it kind of, the way you're putting it kind of sounds a bit like astroturfing. No, yeah. no, 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 this is astroturfing. No, this is actually, the there's a bus. What does that mean? So it's when you set up things. Like it's that. the difference between grassroots and astroturf. You're taking corporate money and you're manufacturing the image of a grassroots movement with corporate money by basically paying people to appear as activists. It just shows how little actual grassroots power they have and how all of their power is at the top. It's not that astroturfing is wrong. It's just that, like your astroturf has to be like committed. committed. We shouldn't have fellows saying, like, honestly, this is bad for my political career. The bus arrives at George Mason University, where Students for Justice in Palestine is holding its national conference. But the protesters can't find the conference hall. They just pull over and ask, hey, where are all the jihadis? The driver sees two students and stops to ask directions. One is wearing a headscarf. Oh, no. Come on. Really oh. Right, back to D.C. Back to D.C. I believe the comments are. <laughs> okay. No, go. Um, excuse me? Do you know where the Johnson Center is? Uh, okay, just like so go back. Straight. Down this. Okay. Okay, thank you. That was problematic. <laughs> so this is off to a good start. <laughs> Students for Justice in Palestine really is a student-led type of organization focused around promoting the BDS cause. We have workshops on how to run a divestment campaign, finding intersections on campus, building alliances. Right now, Palestine has been essentially normalized on campuses. The bus finally arrives. Noah Pollock's protest is not a student event. To avoid breaking university regulations, he's arranged a legal briefing. The SJP conference is on the third floor, and we're going to go up and, in a respectful and quiet way, um, protest them. Yael uh, is a legal expert, and he's going to talk a little bit about that. 
We are here, of course, as guests of the university. So um, we don't want to be accused of disrupting a school-sponsored activity. It is against the law to use abusive or violent language. So we're going to use peaceful, good language. If we see that they're doing anything that is bad behavior, don't engage, remain calm. If you do happen to speak with any reporters, just stay on message. And what is that message? SJP is a hate group. Hate group. BDS is a hate movement. The only other thing you probably want to mention is that SJP endorses violence, terrorism, things like that. And you guys are going to be great. We're not there to provoke. We're not there to have any sort of incident at all. We're nice people. Tony's group of protesters then faced another obstacle. Wow, Mike. I don't know if you guys heard we were stuck in an elevator. Yeah, I really like the area. With, yeah, with all the signs. They were shut us in an elevator. They had someone on the inside. That's anti Semites. We start seeing groups of people coming towards us who don't seem familiar. And then brandishing Israel flags and then posters and signs. Freed from the elevator, Tony joined the demonstration. No, no, no. We support democratic society, but if you don't want to, we denounce extremist groups. What do you think of this? You agree? Resistance? Child suicide bombers? How do you respond to such a wild accusation that's not grounded in anything and that's just designed to, to shift attention? Oh, wait, we support suicide bombers. You that's ridiculous. Um, Before that, that? social That's justice true. left supports radical terrorism. You don't want dialogue? We're here to talk to you. you turn your back. You'd think if, like, they were gonna do, they try to shake it up and mix it up and with new accusations. We don't support radical Islamic terrorism in this country. We don't support suicide bombers. Cowards who kill children and women. They leave orphans. We don't support that. Kill babies and strollers. That'll bring peace. Yeah, Palestinian terrorists all over Israel. That would be it. <laughs> <laughs> Real baby killers, these terrorists. They yeah. kill women, they kill children, they don't care about anything. Rape women too, all the time. It takes a lot to hear this and not respond, and to turn your back to them, and to not look back at them. Thank you, SJP. Good luck with your jihad. They were very frustrated, the fact that we weren't responding. They're saying, they're not even responding. They're not even responding. Yeah, Look at how they wave the Palestinian flag at our country. Look at this. This is These are the real basket of deplorables. These are the deplorables, people. They cower behind radical Islamism. They don't engage in dialogue because they can't win the war of ideas. There's no responding to our content, because there is no refuting our content. Our content is grounded in human rights, morality, ethics, international law. The staged protest had minimal impact on the students at George Mason University. But the headlines shared on social media tell the story Pollock wanted. Yeah, let's uh, head back to headquarters for uh, debriefing and cocktails. In part two, a looming crisis for the lobby. APAC is not representative of the American Jewish community. There used to be actually widespread public support for Israel in the United States. The foundation that APAC sat on is, is rotting. In part one, how support for Israel is falling amongst the young. It's a bad situation. The majority is more favorable towards the Palestinians than the Israelis. Child suicide bombers. And the lobby support on campus isn't always what it seems. Or are these like traitors who sold out to the Jewish conspiracy for money? I'm like, we did. We cost $50,000 plus benefits. Tony went to see his boss at the Israel Project, which is known as TIP, for brunch. Eric told him why Jerusalem is a favorite hub for journalists covering the Middle East. One of the reasons why Israel's covered disproportionately is the overwhelming majority of journalists covering the Middle East are based in Jerusalem. Jerusalem 
is a place where, you know, after his work like deadline, you can get dropped in a bar and meet people over there. Tip is laying the groundwork in the media for a future war between Israel and Hezbollah. We're preparing for the worst case scenario. And if it happens, we have to be ready because that, that war will be one lost, you know, the court of public opinion, not on the battlefield. Journalists based in Jerusalem would likely cover that war. The Israel Project has an office there. We have an enormous interest in affecting the people who are on the ground there, and that's what they do. They build relationships with people who give them information that they can then feed to journalists who are building relationships with. And so the lure is a staff of about like 20 people. She was staff at the Israeli embassy in D.C. for many years. Um, he's a veteran of Israeli politics, but he was like spokesman for a bunch of government ministries. And so he's got a real expertise in dealing with the press. He's an expert at making their jobs easier. So, for instance, we actually now, when there's a terror attack in Israel, our staff gets to the scene usually before the press does. Just because they are so good. They, they still have their vests on and have cameras. And as soon as there's a Twitter an attack, we have like four guys at the scene. Breaking news overseas, a shooting in the heart of Tel Aviv. He has this rapid response team where he has people strategically placed around the country. So if there's an attack, like the Sorona attack at Sorona Market in Tel Aviv. Clearly an attack on a soft target right now based on all the initial uh, preliminary details we're getting from this very fast developing story. They take pictures and they get testimonies. By the time the press gets there, we do the job slow. They, they need, they need, they need information, they need a picture, a video clip, and full service, you know, shop. We just give them. This is new video that just came in, and it shows people in the chaos after this happened as it is night in Tel Aviv. By the time the press got there, we were able to help affect the narrative because, you know, they're all scrambling, you know, they, they need to get this stuff to their editors immediately on what happened back in Brussels or Washington, and, and we were able to get them information. A TIP employee was interviewed by Fox News. Liat Delongovitz, who is live with us on the scene, works for the Israeli project, which puts out news to the foreign press there. Hi, I'm here on the scene. I arrived fairly early. They use children to protect them. The former CNN correspondent, Jim Clancy, first reported on the Middle East in the early 1980s. Those boundaries. When Chip begins interacting with journalists and suggesting the lines and suggesting the interviews, then it's not journalism anymore, it's just propaganda. Liat Delongovitz, who is on scene, again, works for the Israel Project, which works to put news out to the foreign press. During his volunteership at the Israel Project, Tony saw a letter to a donor explaining how Tip had assisted a journalist from CNN. Tip took Will Ripley on a helicopter tour, which seemingly impressed the reporter. Once you arrive in Israel, they come up with a series of things. They know you're in town. They have your number. You get the helicopter tour. That's fun. You get some video that you can use in your reporting. And then they sponsor trips like this one with special access to people that uh, they know, and they can set it up. I visited the Israeli side of the border with Gaza and can tell you the tension there is palpable. Hamas leaders have stated that they are aggressively expanding their underground labyrinth of tunnels. This won't help. The safe room won't protect you from Not a tunnel from that. attack. Not from that. It's a very compelling report, but it's based on an absolute lie. And there are even reports from some residents they are hearing digging underground. The premise of the report is that Palestinians are digging tunnels in order to come up into the bedrooms of Israeli children and to kidnap them or kill them or terrorize them. The document Tony saw claimed the tip's influence created one of the fairest reports on Israel shown recently on a major broadcaster. For those living close to Gaza, it seems only a matter of time before it happens again. It keeps me awake at night. There isn't one recorded case of these tunnels being used to attack Israeli civilians. The report was presented solely from one side. The Israel Defense Forces say the average Hamas tunnel is three kilometers, nearly two miles, costing millions of dollars and tons of valuable concrete, resources badly needed by the long-suffering people of Gaza to rebuild their cities. Tip fully knows that if you're the journalist in Gaza, 
who's doing a report with Hamas sources, your office is damn well going to require that you put in an Israeli voice to counter some of the things that are said there. They well know that if you are on the Israeli side doing a report with mostly Israeli sources, that same pressure will not be applied. You will be allowed to go ahead without trying to get the other side of the story. Why is that? That's because TIP is powerful, and they're going to hold journalists to account. Dedicated to changing people's minds. TIP's promotional video explains its role. We don't attack the media. We become a trusted partner and resource, bringing integrity and facts to the coverage. After an exchange of tweets concerning the Charlie Hebdo attacks in 2015, Clancy left CNN. He is unable to discuss his departure for legal reasons, but recalled instances when the pro-Israeli lobby exerted influence. The big media companies will tell you that, well, maybe they won't tell you this, but they have been harassed. If they had Palestinian journalists who knew the ins and outs of the Palestinian Authority, for example, they were blatantly told to get rid of them, that they weren't trustworthy journalists. Whatever a journalist reports, if it's not liked by whether it's TIP or people within the government, they will put pressure on the media houses, uh, the big networks. TIP's online promotion claims it shapes the way Israel is framed in the international media. TIP changes the way thousands of media reports appear every year. And then we add platforms of our own, getting people talking, taking command of the conversation. This last week, but you know, when I was there, I met with both Herzog and Netanyahu. We exist to kind of articulate the reasons that the notion of a Jewish state is a good thing for us as Americans, and it's a good thing for Jews, and a good thing for Israel, and a good thing for, for, the, for the West, and a good thing for everybody. Block describes the pro-Israel lobby as a three-legged stool propped up by influencing Congress, shaping policy through think tanks, and thirdly, TIP's role, managing the public discourse. You've got the the lobbying, the politics, and you've got the ideas and think tanks, but so you can't define the meaning of those ideas, other people are doing it for you, then the third leg of the stool is there and it falls over. He's brilliant in like a mad scientist sort of way. He was Apex spokesman. Okay. And uh, he was like the troublemaker. You know, he's always breaking the rules, but always getting done. He's very effective at, at strategic communications and dealing with journalists. At APAC, he was the man. I mean, he could get anything on the front page of the Washington Post. The most effective thing you can do in Washington is both explain your point of view and explain why other people disagree with it. Everybody knows that people come with perspectives. You know, reporters and people you know, live in a sophisticated world. But the question is, are you credible? The Israel Project gained notoriety in 2009 after an internal policy document was leaked. It was a phrase book for pro-Israel advocates. Key phrases, words that work, were determined from focus groups. Israel wants peace. I want peace. We want to move forward in peace. We want to start negotiations immediately. The Israeli Defense Forces acted against the launching of rockets by terrorists. Our shooting at our children, at our mothers, at our civilians, what for? Stuff that's being driven, we do a lot of polling. Every month we do a national poll, exactly looking for these kinds of messages that work. If all Palestinians can be referred to as terrorists, as in a terrorist attack, they've won a battle. They've won a battle because that headline will be seen by probably 50 times more people than those who actually went into the article and read the details about it. You don't have any reporters who still free people who churn out uh, carefully crafted headlines with 
article text that convinces you that the headline is true. They understand that it's just the five-word headline or the six-word headline that carries the message. The point is never to get to the real debate. Why is Iran so happy about the Iran nuclear deal? Tip's social media videos had apparently shifted public opinion on the Iran nuclear deal. The American public started out being in favor of the deal, and it's now against the deal. It was everything from viral videos, you know, 10-second videos. You can send me the greatest article you want about the Iran deal, but I promise you that a 10-second video will get a thousand times. People aren't reading as much, they're not interested. In fact, history is a little bit bunk. You know, a lot of people kind of come up now and there's this notion of postmodernism and nothing is true anymore. We are at this sort of interesting moment in time where we need to understand what it is that affects people's understanding and perceptions about what's right and what's wrong and how they work. This visual stimulus and stuff. How are people learning things? During his volunteership, Tony read an annual report to TIP's board of directors. It lauded their social media coverage of the 2016 shooting at Serona Market in Tel Aviv. It said TIP's video was the most watched online content about the attack. The video claimed to show Palestinians celebrating the killing of Israelis, something the mainstream media overlooked. But this was not true. This image was taken in Ramallah two years earlier. There are also other things that we do that are completely off the radar. And we work together with a lot of other organizations. We produce content that they then publish with their own name on it. The Israel Project is supplying what it calls white label, that is unbranded content, to other outlets. We're putting together a lot of pro-Israel media um, through various social media channels that aren't the Israel Project's channel. So we have a lot of side projects that we're trying to influence the public debate with. So that's why it's a secretive thing, because we don't want people to know that these side projects are associated with the Israel Project. TIP runs a collection of Facebook communities that cover topics ranging from history and the environment to current affairs and feminism. But their affiliations to the Israel Project are deliberately vague. Why is it that they can't be connected to the Israel Project? I think it's because like, we want to be people to view them as objectively as possible. <laughs> We have a team of like 13 people and we're working on a lot of like videos, explainers. A lot of it is just random topics. And then maybe like 25% of it would be like Israel or Jewish things. The Israel brand is increasingly toxic. So you can't sell Israel directly. You have to have sort of other hip stuff that's just very innocuous, fun, and then from time to time you're going to slip something about Israel in. Is the idea that all the rest of the non-Israel stuff is to allow the Israel stuff to pass better? Like, that's the key thing? Um, just that we want to, like, blend in everything. TIP's mission is to eliminate any mention of apartheid and occupation. Don't look here, look over here. The visual medium is trumping words. The more image, more visual, more you know, accessible, mm. non-heavy thinking stuff. Kittens are easy to sell. Apartheid is a much harder product to get people to buy. 
more and more people will use the word apartheid when they talk about Israel. The end result is that the lobby has to work extremely hard today and will have to work even harder over time to defend Israel. And of course, in part, this means doing everything that can be done here in the United States and in the West more generally to discredit the BDS movement because the BDS movement is so dangerous to Israel. Tony had gathered that the lobby's concern with BDS was not its economic impact, but a much wider threat to the power of the pro-Israel lobby. The specific potential of an immediate boycott, that's not a problem. It's a bigger problem is the Democratic Party, the Bernie Sanders people, bringing all these anti-Israel people in the Democratic Party. Being pro-Israel is less of a bipartisan issue. And then every time the White House changes, policies towards Israel change, and that becomes a dangerous thing for Israel. There is an actually important battle being fought on the campus. For half a century, bipartisanship has been the cornerstone of APAC's success, as its website video explains. By some measures, Democrats and Republicans are more divided today than at any other time in the last two decades. But America's support for Israel transcends partisan politics. So when it comes to strengthening America's relationship with Israel, support must come from both sides of the aisle. That's where APAC comes in. What's begun to happen over the past decade is that support for Israel has begun to wither away in the Democratic Party. And in contrast, support for Israel in the Republican Party has begun to increase. And what you see is there is a substantial difference today in support for Israel in the two parties. APAC has moved so far to the right that it's losing the young people. By the time of the next presidential election, Democrats will not glibly, in a debate, say they're running for president, and I love Israel, and I'm a die-hard supporter of Israel. The terrain has changed dramatically. If you look at the changing demographics in the United States and what people's views are towards Israel and Israel's policies, it's only a matter of time before that trickles up to elected officials. I think it's inevitable. The kind of shift they fear is the one that happened of uh, same-sex marriage. You know, it was only a short few years ago that high majorities in the United States were opposed to same-sex marriage. That change happened within the space of a decade. The Israel lobby will look at something like that and say it wouldn't take much for that kind of historic sea change to happen with respect for US support for Israel. Outside APAC's 2017 annual conference, the first protesters were American Jews. APAC is facing a challenge from the constituency whose views it was formed to represent. APAC does not represent the American Jewish community. A majority of American Jews are opposed to the policies of the State of Israel. One of the groups involved was Jewish Voice for Peace. The work that Jewish Voice for Peace does is grounded in Jewish tradition, the most basic Jewish and human values that every single person has inherent uh, worth and dignity and should be treated with respect. We then see what's happening to Palestinians, the occupation, the displacement, the inequality, and say, we need to end those things. Or that they must attack for no reason. That's 
as far as I'm concerned, American Jews had one job, which was to preserve Jewish identity from one generation to the next. They failed. So I don't think they have any place to be telling Israel what's what. And if they choose to stop giving money to Israel, Israel will fight money elsewhere. There were few pro-Israel demonstrators. Most wanted to project their strength through Israel's relationship with the United States. The Jewish Defense League, with its distinctive yellow insignias, was a small but threatening presence. Its members later attacked a Palestinian-American man. There's all sorts of survey data for American Jews under the age of 30. Only 32% said that a close attachment to Israel was uh, important to them in terms of what it meant to be Jewish. The more and more young American Jews become aware of what the Israelis are doing to the Palestinians and how indefensible that is, at least in terms of Western values, the more difficult it will be to get those younger American Jews to feel a deep commitment to the state of Israel. I can't breathe! I can't go American Jews are even taking their protest to Jerusalem. The Israeli government official who launched a covert campaign to spy on American citizens, recognizes that Israel is facing a generational time bomb. During Tony's volunteership at TIP, his supervisor, Eric, said he's looking to a future when the pro-Israel lobby will be unable to rely on APAC's influence in Congress. He said they faced a major challenge and a big bowling ball was being hurled towards them. They needed to get on the bowling ball and start dancing. can prove that the APAC is suffering from um, some of the trends that, in public opinion that are affecting the Democratic Party. The APAC is like, it's slipping very, very quickly among Democrats. They're not going to be able to maintain the bipartisan support. So I always say that the foundation that APAC sat on is, is rotting. And that's, there used to be actually widespread public support for Israel in the United States. Um, and so I, I don't think that APAC is going to remain as influential as it is. I don't think APAC is doing this fear anymore, which is worrisome because look who is. Just know I have total faith in you. I don't think, I hope it's not the last time we work together. Full disclosure, I wanted, uh, I would love it if you came to work for me. I need someone who is like a, a team player, hardworking, excited, passionate, curious, well-rounded, well-spoken, well-written. You're all of us. Like